Hello, I'm David Strathairn, and welcome to Moat Marine Laboratory's new series, Ocean Expeditions. Join me and the scientists and crew from Moat Marine as we explore some of the wonders and mysteries of the seas around us. This is the start of an exciting undersea adventure. But to Jim Coulter and Mike Montler, in many ways, it's just another day at the office. Their job today is to investigate a little explored underwater phenomenon. Dotted about the sandy bottom are strange oases, openings rimmed with flora and fauna, which drop off into an abyss. The presence of these springs and blue holes has been known about for many years, primarily by technical sport divers and commercial fishermen. And they have been fishing on these sites or diving on them for many years. Our activities, Moat Marine Labs projects, is the first organized scientific investigation into the springs and blue holes of the Gulf of Mexico. Were they still discharging fresh water? What, if anything, lived at the bottom? Moat Marine Laboratory senior scientist Jim Coulter had long wondered. Florida is mostly made up of porous limestone. Water from the surface enters the limestone and eventually makes its way into the underground water table. Sometimes that table intersects with the surface through a natural opening. And then presto, you've got yourself a freshwater spring. Welcome to Ginny Springs home of some of the clearest water in the world. We're in Florida, where there are more major springs than anywhere else on the planet. 33 of America's 75 largest springs can be found right here in Florida. Beneath its beautiful and peaceful surface, this spring is releasing some three million gallons of water a day. Here is another well-known feature of the Florida landscape, a sinkhole. The Florida bedrock, limestone, is riddled with large cavities that are usually filled with water. Should the water table drop, though, the cavity's walls are subject to erosion, often causing the roof to collapse and a new sinkhole to be born. Although they play a vital role in replenishing groundwater, sinkholes have something of a sinister reputation, and that's because they sometimes seem to appear from nowhere, devouring trees, yards, and even entire houses. Now, what happens to a sinkhole when the water table rises again? It will often fill with water and overflow like a spring, as was the case with the Devil's Den. Florida has more springs and sinkholes than any place on Earth, but there used to be even more of them. In a vastly different Florida 10,000 years ago, the Gulf of Mexico covered far less land, while much of the world was in the frigid grip of the Ice Age. As millennia passed, the ice began to melt and the water started to rise, leaving many springs and sinkholes submerged, lost from sight. They became the Blue Holes of the Gulf of Mexico. Equipped with a remotely operated vehicle containing an onboard camera, Jim and a crew from Moat set out on a journey that would take them to the bottom of several blue holes. The first stop was Naples Spring, some 30 miles off the west coast of Florida. Solid mark, 174. Good numbers. Right on the bottom. At present, we know there are at least a dozen springs and blue holes on oh, the continental right shelf of Florida. However, we don't know how many there are in total. There could be dozens or many dozens of these features on the Florida continental shelf. We just don't know. It has not been widely investigated. We picked the Naples Spring as one of our first sites to visit because of its proximity and because we already knew something about this site. Uh, therefore, it made it a little more accessible and we had some idea of what to expect before we visited this site. Oh, that's the bottom now. That's no, no bottom. Before sending the remotely operated vehicle, ROV for short, on its mission, Jim and Mike decide to do a reconnaissance dive around the rim of the Blue Hole. One of the purposes of the recon dive is for safety aspects. We need what 
to know what to expect in terms of the depth, the visibility, and any potential safety hazards that might be present when we conduct the scientific investigations. Okay, I'm gonna need somebody to crank up that VUCA rig. Another reason to conduct a reconnaissance dive is to gain some preliminary knowledge of the types of communities that we expect in these holes. We take a look at the reef fauna around the hole, the types of invertebrates and fish that occupy this area. For the conditions of the dive, we perhaps had a little more current than we expected as we got to the bottom. However, visibility was quite good. And it was very interesting to note there was quite a variety of reef fauna around the rim. A lot of invertebrates and fishes and uh, complex reef. Oh, it was really cool. Nice ledge, couple ledges that kind of tapered down, then it goes to about 77, 78 feet and drops straight down another 10 feet and then cuts back underneath. And there's a thermocline, it was about 88 feet, 80 feet. And uh, it drops, temperatures probably goes down to 50s. It's really cold. <laughs> okay. I saw a lot of good fish life down there. Uh. Yeah, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of bivalves, flame scallops, um, turkey wings, and they're all, all up under the ledge and stuff. And so they're just all sitting there, and if you wave your hand by them, they all snap shut. A lot of arrow crabs. I don't know if arrow crabs. I don't know if I've ever seen so many arrow crabs. And the sponges are kind of all around the rim also, a layer of encrusting sponges and some tiny little loggerheads and sponges. Um, groupers kind of wander around and they sneak up over and look at you right from you're on top. They kind of look up from the bottom and, and they're just staring right at you. So it's all these two of those, uh, one small, one larger. Yeah, I think the hole was, it's where the, the buoy, the marker buoy is right on the edge of the hole. Yeah, so, and it's drifting out towards the back, yeah. And the hole drops straight down, then it gets about 89, about 89, 9, 88 feet, it gets almost like a cave dive. It slopes back, it starts to get dark, and that's where everything seems to die out. You know, as far as the fauna, there's not much out there below that layer. A few hours later, the crew prepares the ROV for its descent to the bottom of the Naples Spring. The ROV is used as a reconnaissance tool. It, because the ROV can spend a long time underwater, we don't have to worry about how long it is underwater, it can enable us to know what to expect when we plan our dive. And by planning our dive, we can have more bottom time associated with conducting the scientific investigations. We don't have to worry about what we might encounter. The ROV heads downward. It will have to travel about 75 feet to reach the bottom of the gulf. As it goes deeper, a snag develops. We're, uh, we're a little hung up on the cable, so we're trying to go backtrack along the cable and find out where we're hung up. Um, looks like we're going to pull up the weighted line and uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, get the ROV cable back up. If not, we, uh, we may have to make our first dive tomorrow just to uh, get the ROV out of the, out of the blue hole. With a few skillful moves of the controller, however, Jim manages to untangle the ROV. The moat crew isn't the only interested party in the ROV's dive. Finally, it reaches the sandy bottom. The rim of the blue hole comes into sight. It's rich with plant and animal life. The communities around these springs and blue holes are quite diverse, and this is because of the rock outcropping, which acts as a, an oasis. Um, it's kind of in the middle of a sandy desert where these animals can settle out and begin growing. This includes things like algae, 
sponges, gorgonians, soft corals, a number of things that attach to the rock and begin to grow up. And they can't do that on sand substrate. As a result, these things that begin to settle out and grow on the rock attract a variety of other creatures, fishes and other swimming organisms that inhabit these reef areas, and they become quite diverse. The ROV is now ready to head to the bottom of the Blue Hole. After descending almost 200 feet, it reaches its destination. Well, the ROV's on the bottom, and it looks like there is no sign of life. Was the absence of life only a nighttime phenomenon, or is it a permanent condition? The next morning, Jim and Mike make ready to see for themselves. Depends on the depth. Back. Jim pauses to collect some samples for further study. Then it's on to the bottom of the hole. There's a pronounced temperature differential between the surface waters and the waters deep in the hole. Before returning to the surface, Jim takes a core sample from the floor of the hole. Samples in hand, he begins his ascent. On the way back to the surface, we make a decompression stop. This allows the excess nitrogen gas, which builds up in the divers' bodies, to escape. 20 minutes later, he rises to the surface. The dive has generally been a success with some important questions answered. Okay, I left them on the line. Well, it's deep, and at the bottom, the mud is very, very soft and it's silty. Um, I push this core all the way in, but when you push it in, it compresses. So this is what we ended up with. You can see it's kind of this gray, silty material. It's very fine. It has, the water column has hydrogen sulfide gas in it. Now, I didn't take faunal cores because when you have hydrogen sulfide gas, there's nothing, there would not be any multicellular organisms alive in that. Nothing can live in them. So I didn't bother taking funnel course. The blue hole, however, has not yielded up all its secrets. Well, it was, it was kind of actually kind of different down there than I initially expected. We thought we might see boulders or rubble from the surface of the sinkhole collapse. Uh, so there'd be a rocky surface on the top. It was actually covered with some very, very fine sands and silt, which means that there's been a lot of sedimentation occurring. Now, we weren't able to tell just by looking whether the system had ever been exposed and had fresh water in it. A uh, sinkhole that may have developed at a, a period when ocean, when sea levels were lower. Um, it's still a possibility, we just probably won't be able to tell from these samples whether or not that was the case. Their exploration of Naples Springs complete, the crew sets off for its second stop, the Captiva Hole. The data from the ROV confirms that the bottom of the second blue hole, like the first, is a hydrogen sulfide filled dead zone. We need to visit a third site and as many sites as possible. We just don't know if all these sites are the same. We do know that the geologic structure is quite different between springs and sinkholes, and therefore the fauna may be quite different. We have seen some similarities between sites, and yet at the same time we have seen pronounced differences between them. There may be differences between sites nearer to shore and sites further offshore, and we may yet find a site that actually has some flow or some movement of water in the hole. There's a possibility that we may find 
undescribed species in some of these areas. Several months after the first expedition, we set out from Moat Marine Laboratory for another blue hole, commonly known as the AJ Hole, some 32 nautical miles offshore. It's close at hand, yet it's, for many, many years it's just been slightly out of reach. And it is quite critical to science to learn these things and to do the investigations, do the explorations of these sites. Wow, really? I got 109 as deep as I've been so far. And 09684. Oh, God, that's right on. 09672. So what would be the first thing you uh, could tell you that you were, uh, you were sort of beaded onto the hole, some kind of rise I, in the floor or a dark? No, we path? won't see much of that. It's all a very uniform bottom. So here's we get a little bit of growth here like this. There's a little bit of hard bottom, some rocks and sponges mm -hmm. together. There's a sponge. Um, I'm looking for fish or any sort of rock outcroppings. Even with GPS coordinates, it can be difficult to find one of these holes. Most failometers or fish finders are not designed to find relatively small holes in the bottom. Sea conditions, as well as a rocking boat, can all influence how easy it is to find these features. We've spent the better part of about an hour trying to locate the, the hole going over and around and uh, using GPS and uh, the radar that's on the boat, trying to pinpoint the exact location. And they drop a yeah, marker, marker boy, boy, exactly. where they think the uh, the hole is, and then anchor at appropriate distance away so that the boat will drift back over the hole. And we've just sent the ROV down, sort of on a reconnaissance to see how close uh, our uh, our search was. And we're in 104 feet of water right now. ROV. Okay, we've just found the hole. We're at about 107 feet, and as you can see, the congregation of fish right on the edge of it. Right. Another big fish just went above. Now, you sent the ROV down sort of on a reconnaissance because we weren't quite sure where it was to save air time and dive time for yourself, right? Correct. This will be a fairly deep dive, and we didn't want to waste our time looking for the hole. We couldn't pick out the ex feature exactly with our favometer, so we wanted to know where to dive uh, so we don't waste time looking for it. So we sent down the ROV, which we have, we found the hole. Oh, look at that grouper there. Yeah. It's a big one. That's a Goliath grouper. Looking right at it. There's another one coming in on the side. Cool. <laughs> now that's now, about... Now, now they're discussing what we're doing here. Yeah, who are these people knocking on our door? From the surface, the opening of the AJ hole is a drop of about 107 feet. From the opening of the hole to the bottom is another 250 feet. As the ROV penetrates this underwater feature, it drops down through the hole into the ceiling of an underwater cave. As we go deeper, we see dramatic ledges and cliffs that drop off into the unknown. At about 300 feet down, we're entering a dead zone. No fish, no corals, no sponges though there are some life forms that survive. A two-building worm makes its home at this depth. Three hundred and fifty-five feet below the surface, the AJ hole bottoms out. Even the two-building worm seems to disappear. The only sign of life from above is the debris from the rim that has fallen to the bottom. Once the ROV has done reconnaissance, it's time for the diver's point of view. So you're gonna be going down about, well, we'll probably have about 250 feet of line out down to the ROV that's sitting at the edge of the, uh, the hole. So you'll follow that down. Are, are you worried about this depth or? The depth no, the, the, um, the line wraps around, and what we'll do is dive to the lip of the hole, which is about, about 107 feet. And we'll work around the lip a little bit, maybe collect a few samples and take 